Welcome to Why Should We Care About the Indo-Pacific. I am Ray Powell, and I am with James Caruso. As usual, Jim, how are you in New York? We're good here, a little rainy, but another nice day overall, and we're very happy to have a very interesting guest today. Indeed we do. So our guest today is the very prolific Elbridge Colby. Uh, Elbridge Colby was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense in the early Trump administration, 2017-2018. He was in charge of strategy and force development. That put him very much uh, involved with the development of the National Defense Strategy back then, which was a very important document in terms of uh, reorienting our, our outlook on China, uh, especially uh, as, a, as a competitor, as opposed to you know, somebody that we were trying to woo into uh, a, a world order that didn't, they, didn't, they weren't interested in joining. Uh, but he is now uh, the founder of the Marathon Initiative, and we'll ask him a little bit, a, a little bit about that. So Bridge Colby, uh, we're going to start you off with our usual first question, which is, why should we care about America's defense priorities? Uh, well, good to be with you, gentlemen. Uh, pleasure. And uh, well, <laughs> I mean, there's nothing more important than uh, security. Even Adam Smith said that. And uh, if you don't get that stuff right, you can end up in a war and lose it. And there's nothing worse than that uh, for a country. So I think making sure you get the defense priorities right is uh, is essential, especially in an era when we're no longer as uh, dominant as we were, say, 30 years ago. So, uh, Bridge, could you sort of describe the current problem set and maybe how it's changed since uh, you were in the Trump administration? Changed since the Trump administration or before that? Well, you, you, can, you can start with whatever timeline you like, but what, what we keep hearing is this is the most dangerous, difficult time since the 30s. I think that's... Um, so if we start with that, not what do you see? I mean, the early 1960s got a little hairy uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, so, you know, we could... People can have reasonable debate about that, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I was somebody who thought that the uh, I thought it was thought, always thought people were exaggerating, like John McCain when they used to say that we were, 2005 we were living in the most dangerous times. Obvious, it was one of the safer times to be around. But you know, today we we face a first true, really true peer in China. In some ways, you know, it's smaller economy in some ways, but it's a much larger economy in other ways, including in ways that matter more for conflict uh, in terms of its industrial base. And, um, you know, very credible, serious assessments are pretty pessimistic. I mean, I think there's a there's a pretty vigorous debate about exactly where the military balance lies between the United States and China. Um, but I think the most prudent, you know, assessment is that it's it's pretty it's pretty close. It's, it's not we certainly don't, we certainly aren't dominant. Of course, there's also war going on in Europe, which is not going well and is not likely to end anytime soon. There's a war in the Middle East or several wars in the Middle East. There's a possibility of wars breaking out elsewhere on the Korean Peninsula, even in uh, Guyana. I mean, Armenia and Azerbaijan. So I, I, I've been using the term world crisis, you know, conscious that it's sort of ridiculous to use Churchillian language a lot of the time. But I think it's kind of a Churchillian moment, unfortunately, uh, in the sense that, you know, world crises tend to happen when there's sort of structural, you know, deep structural changes where a certain set of powers want to want to take their, you know, re revise this, the, the situation. And that's exactly what's happening right now, with, of which by far the most important is China. So since we're talking about the 30s, you know, what the 30s eventually produced was something of an axis, which we still call the axis powers, you know, the, right. Germany, Japan, uh, Italy. Now we've got China, we've got Russia, we've got Iran, to some degree, North Korea. Is this a comparable kind of axis? Are, in, are you concerned about the formation of an axis? Absolutely. I don't like the term axis for because I think, um, like Robert Kagan would be an example of this, there's a tendency to put everything in the mental frame of the 1930s and 1940s, and, and, or to some extent the Cold War. And there is utility in that, but it tends to be used reductively to kind of simplify things and sort of more of like a drumbeat attitude. Whereas, you know, I think there is a, I mean, I think we are forming an anti-hegemonic coalition, but in the perspective of those countries, which are definitely, have definitely come together as a, as a kind of semi-formal, you know, informal coalition, uh, they believe they're, they're an anti-hegemonic coalition against us and our allies. I mean, if you look at what the Chinese have written about this subject publicly in their Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for instance, they regard their efforts as against American hegemony. So people can argue about what exactly you know that is and it's just, et cetera, but they, they, they are coming together 
shared on, on based on shared interests. I, I definitely don't like the term axis of evil, which is even more lurid and kind of cartoonish. Um, uh, because they, you know, I think they're they're drawn together by shared interest in opposition to the United States. I mean, you have an Islamic radical theocracy in Iran, and you have a Marxist kind of monarchy in North Korea, and you have a sort of quasi-Marxist nationalist government in China, and then you've got a sort of nationalist semi-authoritarian government in Russia, and you've got Maduro, I don't even know what he is. You know, it, it's not primarily ideologically driven. It's driven by these countries having shared interests. Obviously, ideology is an element, but I would say it's it's secondary. And the other the other problem with with the tendency to, to go back into this historical stuff, and again, Kagan is a very useful example of this, where he made a very telling error in a Wall Street Journal piece about a year ago, where he said that China is less of a threat than the three axis states, and we overwhelm them. And that's a mistake. Actually, the Chinese economy is larger relative to the United States than the three axis states were in 1941. And bear in mind that we allied with the Soviet Union and not just Great Britain, but the British Empire, right? There are a lot of Indians who were killed in World War II, and they will remind you, and justifiably so. So, you know, we are we are not in a situation where we don't have an arsenal of democracy right now. We have offshored the arsenal of democracy to China. So we are in bad shape. So I'm, this is the crux of it. What is your prescription? The prescription is we have to get super real, like a business that's, you know, overextended, essentially. And this is not some kind of hair shirt, you know, you know, lashing the back and penance kind of idea of overextension. This is just clearly we we cannot I mean, we know the military cannot fight more than, you know, cannot fight two major wars concurrently. So we have we have 40 something security commitments around the world, depending on how you define it, maybe more. We cannot we face capable rivals, certainly in Russia and China, of course, North Korea as well. Iran in some ways, you know, that that's that's a we could have four conflict. I don't think it's at all implausible that we could be facing. I mean, in a sense that we're already facing two quasi conflicts, obviously not directly against NATO. And we're not involved. Well, we are sort of semi involved in the Middle East, but you could easily imagine, um, and especially because it would be in the interests of this anti American anti American hegemony coalition to challenge us at the same time, because that would be maximally advantageous. And so the thing that a lot of people who talk about the axis don't appreciate is like the fact that they are collaborating means we have to prioritize more because they are more likely to act in, you know, um, uh, in, in sync precisely to deplete and distract and stretch us out and, and, and hit us at the maximally vulnerable time. Whereas if they were acting randomly or individually, that would be less likely to happen. So what do we do about it? We have to prioritize. We have to prioritize our resources, which are in, relative to the scale of the threat scarce. I mean, Americans spend almost a trillion dollars, so it's a lot of money, but we don't get much bang for our buck these days because of costs and the deindustrialization of our uh, you know, of our, our, our industrial base uh, and because our military has been overused in the last 35 years or so. Um, so readiness is a historic lows. So we have to prioritize. And then at the same time, we need to both pressure allies to do more and enable them to do more on their own. So this is obviously with the city Europeans that I, this is my consistent message, but also with the South Koreans in terms of taking more responsibility for North Korea with Israel. And I think also providing sort of political support and wherever possible military support that doesn't decrement from our first island chain defense for for allies that are willing to, to, to deal with their own security issues. India being a great example of this, Israel, uh, hopefully in the future, Poland and South Korea. Um, that's, I think, the model. And that, I think, offers a plausible basis because the combined GDP and latent capacity of the American led coalition or what, you know, whatever we want to call it, this loose, broad coalition is greater than that of the quasi axis or whatever we want to call it. However, it has not been actualized. And many of these society, many of our allied societies have been de demilitarized or effectively demilitarized and their military capacity is in the wrong place. And, you know, as Napoleon or Nathan Bedford Forrest, you know, the, the says, you know, the, the, the person who wins a battle is the one who gets there with the mostest, right? So, you know, if we've got all the military strength in America, but we can't get it in time to be relevant, and in the right place, it ain't going to matter. So that's we're, we're out of position. We're we're kind of flabby in a lot of places. Not so much the United States as our European allies in Japan, Taiwan. That's the big problem. So I'm old enough to remember in 2011 when we were talking about a pivot to Asia, a term that didn't last very long because it created quite a little bit of a freak out, I think, 
Um, it, but that's a, it sort of sounds like that's what you're saying is that we actually need to get around to pivoting to Asia. And, and so if we do that, what does that actually look like when it comes to the disposition of our forces? I mean, what is, what are we, what do we actually pivot in fact? Well, the pivot was a good idea. We should have done the pivot. We didn't do the pivot. The problem with the pivot, and this is not a critique of people like Kirk Campbell who were pushing it, um, because the political situation probably didn't allow it at the time. I think it was too vague and it wasn't sufficiently focused on China as the main threat. So it was kind of this like, this kind of vague Asia is the future stuff. And there wasn't like a military planning thing. There were elements, there were attempts within the Pentagon through like the air sea battle initiative to give it more concreteness, but they didn't succeed for reasons that are not the fault of the people who were pushing it at all. Um, but you know what we need to do is i mean i think actually we know what we need to do and actually this is th this part of the the discussion i think is kind of over which is that the department u.s department of defense says that we need the denial defense effectively for the pacing scenario which is taiwan the australian ministry of defense official position is that they are adopting a strategy of denial japan uses a similar terminology and taiwan is moving in the direction of this asymmetric defense so, which is basically about defeating the invasion. It uses, if you can defeat the invasion of Taiwan, you, by definition, you can essentially defeat the invasion of the Philippines or Japan. South Korea is a little different, but I mean, we can go into that if we want, but, but I think that basically would solve our problem. So I don't, at the, at the sort of macro defense strategy level, I think this, this is, I mean, the 2018 national defense strategy and the 2022 national defense strategy, from what I can tell, are quite basically indistinguishable, indistinguishable but they're very, very similar on this point. Um, so, you know, what does that mean in terms of disposition of forces? It doesn't mean like throwing all your forces on Okinawa because Okinawa is tremendously vulner vulnerable to Chinese attack. What it means is that our forces are ready, properly positioned, et cetera, to be able to blunt a Chinese attack on Taiwan. This was the term we used in 2018, you know, the blunt layer. The blunt layer is not actually physically necessarily right there because it may use standoff munitions. I mean, a B-2 operating from the continental United States is more relevant to a Taiwan defense than a ship in Papua New Guinea that can't get to the, the fight and can't survive, in a, in a, even though it's closer, right? Now, I do think there is a strong role for forward deployed or rotational, whatever the right move is. And that's why I think actually the U.S. Army Pacific and the Marines force design are very valuable because it's really difficult to... Uh, you know, when people say that a Taiwan fight or some, one of these fights would not be a ground fight, that's ludicrous because we have to assume the Chinese would get ashore. Of course, ground forces can also reach out and touch aircraft and ships that are approaching Taiwan or in the future. You know, what Andrew Krepinevich has called the archipelagic defense model is, I think, very, very sound. And if you look at the difficulty that our, our troops had, our Marines had, had in getting Japanese forces out of Iwo Jima and Okinawa and Tarawa and Saipan and Peleliu, et cetera, that that's a that's a great problem to be able to pose to potential PLA power projection. So that's, I think, what the model looks like. And then, I you know, I tend to be very agnostic in exactly what that looks like. You know, that can be submarines. It can be, you know, advanced bombers. The problem with relying on those capabilities is they're very expensive. They take a long time to build. There tend to be few of them. They have to be in the right place. They have to be maintained. You know, it's sort of a mix. That's where like the Marines and the Army can come in if they're properly positioned. They have the right weapons like NASAMs or um, HIMARS. And I guess they were using ATACMs in Balakatan the other day. Uh, I can't remember. or uh, Maybe it was a PRISM, an early version of PRISM, which is encouraging. These kinds of capabilities and, and others are much more expert on that uh, than I. But, you know, and then new technology is great. I am skeptical of betting the farm on new technology which is a little bit of a concern for me. So something like the department's replicator initiative is great, but I don't think it's prudent for us to count on a sort of fundamental offset, if you will, of the PLA for a number of reasons. One is we don't know their work, like nobody's really tried to put these all together and operate them effectively in an incredibly contested and, and lethal environment. Um, also the Chinese are pretty good at like, not just drones, but electronic warfare jamming, cyber capabilities, et cetera. So I think we need a multi-layered defense. I laid this out in a proceedings article last year, layered both geographically, but also in kind of ways, if you will. So you earlier said 
that the combined efforts of the U.S. and its allies and partners should be enough to offset what we're not calling an access. But yeah. what you're proposing is a pretty significant shift in the U.S. approach. How do you think we work with our allies and partners to get them to buy in and do what they need to do to step up? Being honest with them, that's what I do. I mean, that's essentially what I'm doing. And I, and I think one of the reasons that you see ally changes that people like me are saying things. And, and here's the thing. People respond to it. Maybe I'm naive, but they respond to honesty and facts and clarity. So you got the Biden administration and a lot of old school Republicans going around saying everything's fine. Nothing's going to change. You can we can just keep going as we were. Don't worry about it. The Americans will do everything. People can see that's not going to work. And the point I always make to like the Poles and the Baltic states and the Koreans and the Taiwanese, et cetera, is like, you're the frontline states. When that model catastrophically fails, you're the one who are going to pay the price. It's not the, the people in the Beltway who've been the biggest advocates. They're still going to be writing for the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal or the AI or whatever. That ain't going to change. What's going to change is that we're not going to be able to stop, say, a Chinese invasion of Taiwan or a Russian attack into the Baltics. And then they're gonna say, oops, well, it was somebody else's fault, but I wish I'd known, but the, the, no, 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 no. Like we can't, you can see it. You can see it that we don't have the capacity. We're not, the House Armed Services Committee just came out with their markup of the NDAA, I think that involves the top line that was given in the two-year deal that McCarthy made with the Democrats. You know, maybe there's some extra money that'll come in, but it's not gonna dramatically change anything. And, and by the way, we've seen like with the Ukraine aid, that's pumping tons of money into the current defense industrial base does not lead to dramatically different outcomes. I mean, look like our price of artillery shells goes up because all these subcomponents are in high demand now. So I think that's, you know, and just being honest with them, like that's what I do with the South Koreans. That's what I do with the Europeans. They don't necessarily like it at first, but then it's sort of stages of grief. And I think you can see that and you can see people like Boris Pistorius, the minister of defense in Germany, to some extent, the Poles, the Finns, uh, David Lammy, the, the shadow foreign secretary in the United Kingdom. By the way, some of these are left wing governments. In fact, all of the ones I mentioned are left, basically left wing governments. That's not a right left issue. They're saying, OK, I get it. I see the writing on the wall. We're going to have to move in that direction. And then it's a negotiation about how you do that and what the new balance is. But then I think you're having a much more realistic negotiation that reflects reality that's going to be safer. And by the way, look, that's why I call I talk about denial. And whenever I talk to the Chinese or try to communicate with others like that. You know, my point is it's, this is about denial. We're, we're playing strategic defense here. This is, we are the, we are not looking to overthrow the Chinese Communist Party or in my view, Putin. I don't like Putin. I think he's, what is the invasion of Ukraine is evil, but we are basically trying to defend the areas that we've committed to that are part of our critical part of our coalition. That is generally easier than trying to conquer you know, significant areas. So it's, you know, we kind of, especially when we're dealing in Asia, where we're talking about archipelagos as opposed to, you know, land borders. So how does this language of honesty or sort of, you know, cold, you know, cold hearted honesty, okay, this is what's, this is what's going to happen. And this is where America is. How does that interact with assurance, you know, and how does that actually, you know, isn't it possible that all of this Honesty can also lead to a negative deterrent because the you know one of the real dangers and maybe even the most likely outcome or most likely uh, outcome if China is going to achieve some of its aims is not to get it through force of arms but through what it's been doing for years which is coercion and so as we say to Taiwan look you know you can't expect America to show up and and, and bleed and die in Taiwan if you're not willing to spend on your own defense. How much of that does, do they hear as, oh, you can't count on America. Maybe we need to cut our best deal now. Uh, the whole assurance thing is kind of way out of proportion after the end of the Cold War. Like it, my theory, and I found this in the Pentagon, having studied the Cold War stuff a lot, assurance wasn't like a mission of the armed forces during the Cold War. Because you know what? The focus was like on defeating a Soviet invasion and, and thus deterrence. This is like basic psychology, right? We don't want to over assure people. That's what we've done. We've over reassured these people and actually inaccurately reassuring them beyond what is actually reasonable for the American people to, you know, sustain. I mean, the great example, of this is Afghanistan. I mean, you had people like H.R. McMaster and all these saying, we'll be there forever, we'll be there till the end of time. And ultimately, 
there was a time limit on America under both President Trump and President Biden. I mean, President Biden was the one who withdrew him, but President Trump also, you know, was the one who initiated the withdrawal of U.S. forces. So, you know, how does it help our allies to give them too much reassurance such that they inaccurately understand actually how far we will go? That doesn't, I don't think that's doing anybody any favors. Moreover, Chinese coercion, gray zone coercion basically doesn't work. I mean, it's totally backfired in Taiwan. They've elected a green presidential candidate. I mean, my friend Dan Blumenthal has a piece out by this. I find it totally unconvincing. They're not going to, I mean, Taiwan would be the most propitious example for gray zone coercion to lead to submission. But in fact, Chinese attempts to do so have led to the strengthening of opposition on Taiwan to the PRC. And this is a critical thing, by the way, the Kuomintang is not a pro PRC party. The Kuomintang is not even in favor of one country, two systems anymore. So there's no political constituency on Taiwan for unification under the terms that, that the People's Republic is offering, let alone in the Philippines, where China's gray zone activity has pushed the Chinese, the Filipinos much more back into our into our camp. Um, so I'm like really not that worried about the gray zone stuff, because at the end of the day, they're going to have to like put a gun in the Taiwanese face to get them to give up. Um, and then the question is like, well, is are the American people going to do what's necessary to help you? And that is a conditional thing. And that's I'm sure you guys talk to people all the time. I mean, I talk to a lot of people, I talk to members of Congress about this. The, the perception in the United States is that the Taiwanese don't take their support, their security very seriously. And thus that support for defending Taiwan is much softer than many people would, would assume. And I think it's important to communicate that to the Taiwanese. I, in fact, did communicate that to the Taiwanese leadership directly last month. You know, I'm not worried about Lai Ching De and B. Kim Shao and Joseph Wu surrendering to China. <laughs> There's no chance that they're going to do that. What is a problem is that China could perceive that there's no chance of that, but that they're militarily weak. That is the danger. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to interrupt Jim, Jim just for a second, um, because I, I want to push back on some of that. You know, I'm very associated with what's been happening in the Philippines. And, you know, there was a time in which, you know, there was a president in the Philippines. And actually, you, you were in the Pentagon at this time where the president basically said, Look, we can't go to war with China. They're too big. They're too strong. We just need to, you know, work with them as best we can. And essentially led into a six-year period in which the Philippines was consistently consistently acquiescing to China, especially in the South China Sea. So, you know, it's not as if gray zone uh, tactics don't work. Uh, you know, so are you saying that they, they simply don't example. work to the yeah, extent that's that? A perfect example, like Ferdinand Marcos's father. The, the, their perception was that they, we assisted in the overthrow of his father, right? And like, so, so Bang Bang Marcos doesn't have like a lot of, there wasn't like necessarily good, like he wasn't coming in being like the super pro-American candidate. It's the precise fact that Duterte did all that. And the perception was that Manila got like nothing except further humiliation and that their only recourse was to the United States. So we'll see what happens. I mean, I'm not saying like, but there's no way the Philippines is going to surrender to China. Now they may, whether or not they go forward with EDCA and other deployments, that is true, but that only matters if there is a war, right? Like that's, so it all ultimately comes down to, to a perception, whether there is a war or a perception that there might be a war and, and capitulation because they feel now that, that I think could happen on Taiwan. That's not gray zone. That's more like an ultimate, you know, I, I, they, the Chinese put a gun to the Taiwanese head and they say, are you feeling lucky punk? And the, and the Taiwanese say, there's no way we're going to end up leaving Ukraine and we're going to get conquered. That could lead to capitulation, but that's not gray zone. That's like an ultimatum. You know, this gets back to the question of, you know, assurance is a tough thing. Ray and I spent a lot of our careers in Asia where the Chinese propaganda is constantly that, oh, the U.S. pivots to Asia. They can pivot back again. We're in the neighborhood. We'll always be here. So there's always been this effort of the U.S. to give them some trust in our staying power. Now, if if we move all our assets or more of our assets to Asia, that's still a signal that we can change again. Do you think that needs to be addressed or you're saying countries' self-interest will dictate what they do anyway? Yeah, well, ultimately, yeah. I mean, look, look how successful our policy in Asia has been. And a lot of it has happened in this administration, but it, a lot of it started in the last administration, two very different administrations. I mean, the Chinese propaganda is not working. 
right? I mean, China's at historic lo lo lows of popularity and assessments throughout Asia, if you look at like the Pew polling. And everybody can see they beat up the Filipino fishermen. They're doing stuff with the Indians. They're doing stuff with Bhutan. You know, they're surfacing new claims all the time. They've seen what they do in the South China Sea. So the frontline states, as you would expect, are worried. And that's Japan, Taiwan. South Korea has moved more in, in our direction, although it's kind of a <clears throat> special case because of North Korea, um, India, uh, Australia. And then the second tier states, you know, this, the ones that have a little bit of a buffer, they're tending to kind of keep try to keep their heads down because they, you know, it's the you know, whatever the the mice don't want to get trampled by the elephants sort of policy, which, you know, is 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 rational. I mean, the if we don't pivot our force, like the problem is not I mean, all, the Biden administration just goes around saying grandiose things to Asian countries all the time. That's I don't think anybody questions our ability to say that we're committed. My, my point is, can we back it up? Like, I think President Biden has said a lot of stuff. Like he said four times that we would defend Taiwan. He said we would be with the Ukrainians as long as it takes. You know, I don't know. Like, but if the United States can't win and would be horribly bloodied in a Taiwan defense, I don't think even President Biden would necessarily do that. So the most important thing is to back up our strategic interests and our commitments with real military capabilities speak softly and carry a big stick. I don't, I think we talk a lot. That's not, I don't think that's the deficit where the deficit is. So you talked earlier about B2s and as you, uh, I think are aware, we, we only had 20 of them. Apparently we have 19 now. Um, yeah. This brings us into the whole question of the defense industrial base, which you alluded to also earlier. Yeah. Uh, isn't it, you know, really, if, if we're talking about the problem of being one of, of capability, isn't it imperative that we address immediately and with great urgency this issue of our, our defense industrial base? Yes. And you know what is the role of uh, the defense industrial base in your concept of how we defend Asia? Yes, totally. And that's why, the, like, if, if probably the number one thing I've been banging on about like the last two years has been what I've been saying like a national mobilization of our defense industrial base. Like, I don't think what we're doing now is remotely adequate for what we would need. I mean, first off, just for a war with China, God forbid, right? I mean, we can't produce munitions fast enough, let alone things like attack submarines or penetrating bombers or satellites or whatever, right? We're in, but if we want to do that and we want to supply our European allies and our Israeli allies and sell stuff to the Indians and the Egyptians, and the Emiratis were like so way, way, way behind what we need that we're that, that I think it's going to involve, you know, essentially what we've been doing is like pumping money in to the existing system and then like making some small changes like multi-year procurements that within the current structure may be like the least bad thing you can do. But fundamentally, is not going to resolve the problem because and exactly the roots of the problem, I don't fully pretend to understand. I think it has to do with consolidation, deindustrialization you know, inconsistent demand, et cetera, multiple, multiple factors, right? Um, deliberate Chinese efforts to corner critical components and minerals, et cetera. Um, but I don't see anything like the level of national urgency that would be required. And I don't really get it, actually. Like, why hasn't, why didn't President Biden use some of that enormous amount of political capital and money that he invested in, like, the clean energy investments uh, into the defense industrial base? Like, I don't, I mean... I don't know. I think a lot of Democrats would support that. In fact, I know some Democrats would some Democrats would support Ro, Ro Khanna from California. I bet Sherrod Brown from Ohio or Debbie Dingell from Michigan. I bet, you know, kind of hard hat Democrats would, would, would love to support something like that. And so to me, you know, if, if there's a Republican administration, I hope there is. I mean, I think, you know, and I don't speak for anybody else, but my proposal would be like one of the early things would be a reindustrialization agenda that would include as part of it a revamp, a really fundamental revamp of our defense industrial base. And I think everything needs to be on the table, including like more direct government intervention, subsidies, tariffs, et cetera, because like, obviously what we're doing now ain't working. I mean, I find it staggering the amount of money we spend and the difficult, I mean, every single Navy program is, is behind schedule. You know, the ICBM is behind schedule and overpriced, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the attack submarines, big problem. Even the number one Priority for the nation, the Ohio, uh, the Columbia class replacement to the Ohio SSBN behind schedule. You know, so this is we, we've got to really, really revamp this. And I, I think it's 
I think it's kind of overdetermined why it's in America's interest. So how do you see our allies, especially Australia and uh, UK, given the AUKUS agreement, how do you see them fitting into our uh, industrial supply defense base? Well, I think we need to scale up. And I mean, my, <laughs> I think we can't expect um, our allies to, but what we want as Americans, in my view, is for our allies to assume more security responsibility for their own, for their own uh, security, defense responsibility for their own security. Um, so um, that means that I don't think it's realistic for us to expect them, you know, for a long haul to send money just to the United States to buy American weapons. That's what a lot of them do, like the polls and others to kind of there's a curry favor element. But actually, the other thing is it doesn't help us. You know, so first, I don't think they're going to sustain higher level defense spending unless it's recycled in their own economies. Two, it actually doesn't help us because it actually clogs up our defense industrial capacity, which is inherently limited because of scarcity and lack of components and lack of skilled workers on things that are actually not our priority, whereas our priority is Asia. So it'd actually be better if like Japan, I mean, South Korea has a good defense industry, but like if Japan, Poland, Germany, et cetera, had stronger defense industries, by the way, that should scale up together. So everybody should be able to benefit because there will be commonality of demand. And we may need, we may need to lean more on some of our allies. I know the Navy has been talking about working with the Japanese and Korean shipyards. I mean, that's too bad because the Japanese and the Koreans were part of the effort to take shipbuilding capacity out of the United States, which we allowed to happen. But we're sort of like up a creek right now since you can't fix shipbuilding from one year to the next. So uh, let me let me just push on that for just a second. Are, are you saying that you know, you're saying that optimally we would rebuild our defense industrial base here at home? But in the short term, we're going to have to rely on sort of an extended defense industrial base, relying on partners, allies, uh, in order to sort of supplement our our needs in in the short term. Yeah, I think we got to, we got to revamp our defense industrial base for multiple reasons, and of course, our defense industrial base will be by far the largest, hopefully, I assume. Um, and we want our allies to do more over time, because that will take some time on our part, and there are just inherent whatever you know, gerbils in the boa constrictor kind of problem, we may need to plug gaps. Like if the Japanese could help us like build a ton, I think they are co-producing patriots, you know, I mean, we just, we can't get enough patriots, right? We just can't. So like the more patriots, the, the better. And I think we should increase our own production of patriot, but it will also need the Japanese to do it. The, the Chinese doubled their miss, missile inventory just in the last three years. We could like never have enough patriots at this, at this rate. So that's sort of how I think we should be going about it. But that that way, it sort of I think it addresses the buy American concerns, which is that we would be like offshoring these critical industrial capacities, because, no, I think we need the industrial capacity at home. But we also need to plug gaps militarily in this sort of shorter to medium term. <clears throat> well, the other thing, of course, is the supply chain and so much still coming from China that we're trying to shift to other countries. But you would accelerate that, I take it. Yeah, I mean, certainly in the military domain, I think they're. I think they had shut down F thirty five production for a little while because they identified that one of the components was coming from China. So, I mean, certainly for military components, we should not be relying on the country that we're most worried about fighting. That seems pretty obvious, right? So, Bridge, we're, we're getting close to the time, and I know you got to you got to yeah. go. Um, what is the Marathon Initiative, and what are you trying to do through it? Sure. It's a 501c3 nonprofit. And my, my great friend and partner, Wes Mitchell, we founded it to be able to do kind of real strategy. I think there's a lot of think tanks out there that are you know good at convening conferences or hosting speeches and are very, you know, have a kind of an inertia because they, um, you know, they're sort of status quo oriented. Or they're kind of bureaucratized. We're different. You know, it's almost like the government. Different people have different roles. But, it, you know, to us, the a real function of the original idea of the think tank was to do like real strategy, cross cutting, go where the logic leads and, um, and, and, and let the chips fall where they may for the country's best interest. And, you know, that's, what we're, that's what we're doing. I mean, we've got a great group associated with us, you know, Ed Ludbach, um, uh, David Hale and a bunch of people, Bob Kaplan, uh, on our advisory board, um, Nadia Shadlow's on our advisory board. So, you know, people with different views. So we're not, we don't have like a company line. It's not a company. We don't have a, a party line, um, but uh, but you know, looking for people who are really dealing with the toughest strategy questions, and uh, you know, unfortunately, I, I think that's rarer than than it should be. So we, um, you know, we're 
we're, we're, we're plugging away, hoping to try to change the, the national conversation on this and provide, you know, it's not really like a practice sort of like day to day government thing, but more like the outlines of a, you know, a strategy that deals with the world crisis that we're facing. Uh, and I'll get you out of here on this. I, uh, I, I do follow you on X and I noticed yeah. you make an extraordinary effort to try to respond to everyone. How on earth do you do this? <laughs> Well, my model became essentially untenable because I was subjected to this like this group called NAFO over. So what I what I used to do, I mean, the thing about X to me that's so amazing is like you can say what you want when you want on your own terms. So for those of us who grew up in an earlier era, you would have to like shop an op ed or sign some open letter. And now I can say exactly what I want when I want in the format that I want. And then. It's an incredible community in the sense that I'm talking to people in India and Europe and Asia and Africa and America, wherever, you know, like all over the place. And, you know, my sort of rule is um, people who aren't, um, you know, ad hominem, who don't distort me in what I'm saying, who are not abusive or whatever. I'll basically try to, you know, earlier when I had fewer followers, I would really try to almost respond to everybody. And that was viable. About a year ago, it was it became untenable to respond to everybody. Um, so then I kind of shifted. I'm a little more selective, but I try to, I make a point that I don't care how many followers you have. If you have a good point or you're offering a good question and vice versa, if you're a jerk and, you, and you're, you know, distorting my points and you got a million followers, whatever, you know what I mean? Like that's, that's, uh, I mean, I'm not perfect. I mean, I, I don't have like some very, you know, perfect logic, but that's sort of the vibe. And then, then this like this NAFO thing, which is basically like a, like a, I don't know, I think it's largely organic or, you know, sort of like a network on, but they like flood with, flood my notifications with all these, um, you know, kind of like childish stuff, memes, like all this sort of, and that makes it hard. I can't, I can't see who's saying something that's actually viable, which is unfortunate. I think, I think, I mean, it seems to me, I said, I think I said earlier today or yesterday, I was saying it to like Musk or something. Um, hey, like with all this AI stuff, can't we have like a better filter? You know, like if somebody's got a dog in, in there, or like a cartoon dog, you know, that are like a NAFO or fella, you know, like, can I just mute that? You know, that would be nice. And then, you know, I'm, they can say whatever they want. I'm just not going to deal with it. What disturbs me a little bit, though, is that is that there is there has been government endorsement of NATO um, by Estonia by Lithuania, and then there was a NATO summit where the uh, the chief chairman of the military committee, Admiral Bauer from the Netherlands, was saying positive things. And my concern there is like it's annoying, and it it it, it, it takes a very effective tool out of the hands of people like me who want to use. Not it doesn't take it out, but it makes it more difficult. But is that is that um, I'm really concerned that NATO is becoming NATO and Ukraine are becoming like very deeply embedded in the very divisive American political situation. My view is that we should look at NATO and Ukraine through the interests of American strategy and foreign policy. And we should like, you know, we have our domestic issues. That's for us, the Americans to decide. You have your domestic issues. That's why I emphasize that like people like David Lammy or Boris Pistorius may be of a different ideological persuasion, but we can work with them. But when you have these entities that 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 are highly uh, involved in like very nasty way in the American domestic political thing that will conflate. And this is a problem going forward because for instance, like the NATO summit is going to be in Washington in July, like in the midst of a presidential election. I don't know whose idea that was, but that person should probably not get promoted. You know, like that was probably not a wildly great idea, you know, given these issues are already fraught and like, let's turn down the temperature on the domestic stuff and say, let's look at this together, structurally, pragmatically, to, to make this alliance work for the long haul. So that's sort of, that's sort of what I'm trying to, you know, and you kind of, it's the, the way I equated it to is like, if you speak on a university campus and you just got people shouting, shouting over you in the, it's like, okay, I mean, you can't, you can't, you can't get, so you, you can't, you can't like deal with it, but you also can't stop what you're doing and you're, you can't change your approach just because there's a bunch of, you know, irresponsible people acting that way. Well, on that civil note and call to civility, uh, Bridge Colby, <laughs> never boring. Thanks very much, sir. There you uh, go. What's the what is the best place for people to follow your work? Well, I think you can go. Um, I mean, the most if you want the 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 full the full uh, not you know not light reading necessarily, but hopefully accessible is my book, The Strategy of Denial, 
uh, or our webpage at the Marathon Initiative. Uh, if you look at my page, it's got a lot of stuff, you know, articles and, and comments. Or you can go to X and you'll get a sense of what I'm saying. That's a little bit more punchy, obviously. So but anyway, gentlemen, it's a pleasure to talk to you and uh, look forward to being in touch. Thanks, Bridge. Well, Jim, as I said, uh, Elbridge Colby is never boring. Uh, and I know that, you know, even you and I and other people I'm, I'm in contact with uh, in preparing for this, a lot of people have a lot of very strong opinions about what he has to say. Well, he is proposing a pretty radical change in what's been U.S. policy for at least since the end of World War II. Um, so that's always going to get people riled up. Um, but I think the other thing is you and I as sort of practitioners on the ground um, see things in a way that maybe those who have spent their time in D.C. and reading books may not see. Yeah, or or in writing books. And I mean, so he has the, I think that he's an important voice, right? He's somebody that we need to sort of hear out because he is pointing out important problems. And he's sort of demanding that we take those problems seriously. And so I get that, right? I mean, as I indicated in the in the discussion, we tried to pivot to Asia once upon a time and never really quite got there. And so, I mean, to hear somebody say, yeah, we just need to get there. That's, I mean, there's, there's something a little refreshing about that, even if it's very also, you know, very troubling in sort of what, what some of the, the consequences would be. For sure. And, and, you know, his point that uh, the U S is facing a near competitor and therefore our strategy has to adjust to that. That seems right. Um, I guess the question is, how do you do that and not harm the alliances and partnerships, which, as uh, Bridge said, are the basis for our ability to compete and win? So right. yeah, I, economy there. I really kind of felt like he under he's under processed the effects of you know failing to assure. So I mean, I, he he very quickly dismissed that as a as as a thing, and I think that. You know, again, we've been sort of out and, and, and you know, I mean, we it, it's important to challenge our own thinking about this, too. But, you know, it is important that every one of these countries has its own internal political dynamic. Right. And so it's not just about convincing a few people in their sort of bureaucratic establishment. that They should spend more on defense. They have to go through an entire process of deciding what they're going to do politically because these are de democracies. And if a particular you know, politician, and I, I brought up Rodrigo Duterte, of course, um, is able to sort of sell the idea that we can't, we can't, you know, the, we can't compete, we can't uh, stand up, we, you know, the United States isn't reliable. If they, if they sort of sell that to their own people, or at least even to their own, you know, uh, uh, government, then, you know, in the case of the Philippines, there were several years there where we were not able to do very much. And I take a lot of comfort in the fact that we have been able to rebuild and maybe even make stronger that alliance in the long term. But in the short term, you know, China made a lot of advances in the South China Sea over that period of time. And so, I mean, I think that I would love to have had a longer discussion with him. And this is you know, we tend to think these are long form podcasts and that we have enough time. And we, I just would have loved to have had a much longer discussion with him about that problem. Yeah. I, well, look, it, it, we also know in Southeast Asia, maybe Philippines and to some degree Vietnam aside, um, they look at China as more critical to their economic fortunes than to the U.S. And the fact that the U.S. has not participated in trade agreements in a long time just sort of cements that. So if the choice is going to be from China, Look, you let us have more access to your uh, 200 mile EEZ, and we'll let you keep trading with us, and we'll both get rich together. Or you put your chips on the Americans, who may pivot away again. And by the way, they keep closing up their markets. Yeah, I, um, I mean, again, we, we we keep harping on this, but you know, having sort of been there and, and experienced that in a lot of these countries, you know that the question of U.S. staying power is a constant one. And um, and that really is central to our assurance and deterrence value. Um, and ultimately, that's what we're talking about. Right. We want to deter not only war, which, of course, we absolutely want to do, but we want to deter 
coercion. We want to de deter the the adversary in the gray zone where they are they are trying to advance their objectives. I mean, that, I think I still think that China's primary uh, uh, its primary weapon is a gray zone, or the, the new the new term is ICAD, uh, illegal, coercive, aggressive, and deceptive activities. Um, but you know these gray zone activities. Uh, that's still what China wants. They do not want to go to war. I'm convinced of that. They're preparing to go to war. And I think that Bridge correctly brings up the fact that we have to be ready for that because the worst thing in the world is to end up in a war against a peer competitor that you're not prepared for. You know, we won World War II, but it was not, it was not a quick and bloodless war. Now, I, I mean, look, this is an important debate. I think Bridge is an important voice in bringing up an alternative way of approaching the problems. Um, and hopefully the debate will continue because um, it's yeah. hard to find a solution to competing against a peer competitor. Uh, that is seemingly, he doesn't want to call it an axis, but it sure rhymes with axis with Russia, Iran, and North Korea. Absolutely. Uh, well, again, and he could, you know, I mean, his name has been floated as a potential senior appointment in a, in a potential uh, second Trump administration. So his voice could actually become quite important. So it's it's important that we heard him today. Absolutely. And, but on that note, Jim, it is it is it is story time and it is there I was time and it is absolutely your turn, sir. <laughs> Tag. All right. So I was on my first tour as a foreign service officer in Santo Domingo doing consular work. And at that point, he said, all right, Jim, your job today is to go up to the prison up in the mountains where there's some Americans being held prisoner. And you're going to go and check on their welfare and hand out magazines and vitamins. Okay. So I went with a local staffer. We drove for a few hours up to this prison up in the mountains. We get there and uh, foreign, the foreign national who worked for the embassy said, OK, you'll find these six guys in there. Okay, how do I find them? Oh, they'll find you. Well, aren't you going to come with me? Oh, no, I'm not going in there. <laughs> so, so I walk in, no guard with me, nothing. And I'm calling out the names of these guys. And I'm thinking, you know, I could disappear without a problem. But they were all really nice. They wanted to share stories with me. Of course, they were all innocent drug dealers. Um, of course. But, but I was uh, a little uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just to give an idea of what a, uh, a state department officer sometimes does. Well, um, yeah, that is unlike, uh, my concept of what would happen in a, a consular visit to prison. So, uh, yeah, uh, wander in and call out the names of the people that you're seeking in a prison. So that that's in a prison that your escort won't go into. That's correct. So. It's safe enough for me because, uh, you know, I look different. Well, uh, so we, we, we just in case we think that the Foreign Service has become too bureaucratized and and uh, and too buttoned up, we have Jim Caruso delving into uh, into prisons. All right, Jim, this has been a blast. Uh, really interesting conversation. Uh, we've got some super ones coming up. Uh, so thanks for, for joining us today. Thanks again to Jim uh, and to Ian, our, our outstanding producer. Uh, we will, you know, invite you to keep, continue to, to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you watch it on YouTube. If you're getting us on a streaming service, please uh, hit that subscribe button. Uh, we are definitely making great strides and reaching a lot more people. So thanks for joining us today. For Jim and Ian, I'm Ray. Thanks for joining us for this uh, Why Should We Care About the Indo-Pacific. <laughs>